Okay. For today, let's start. Basically, in like in today's chapter, we'll be focusing on three things related to business: the business structure, business integration, and business process re-engineering. Right. So, business structures and stuff should only be like as a should be a proper revision. And again, um, advantages disadvantages are where your whole answer lies. Right. Uh, if you all remember business structures, those things like functional, divisional, network, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Business structures being how there are different structures which we already know and will revise, and how information requirements differ from structure to structure. If say it's a big company, small company, obviously the information needs really differ. The second uh, part of the chapter is business integration. Obviously, as you become a big business and like the company grows, they look at other things to integrate with their core business, right? Uh, integration of people, operations, strategical expansion, technology, etc., etc. And finally, the key area in this chapter that we'll be focusing on is business process re-engineering, which basically means that. If you've grown too big, but things are chaotic, you're always you can always restructure your business, redesign your business, reimagine your business, and improve things overall. Right. So just going into business structures and you know revising them. There are three types of business structures mainly: functional, divisional, and virtual. Let's have a look at them one by one. so functional structure as the name suggests fairly straightforward in a business you divide the whole organization in functions functions being marketing sales operations all sorts of things and they are then responsible for the whole company's marketing the whole company's sales the whole company's operation then it's not to do with the area or the product or any sort of those things when it's functions it's functional expertise that we look at and in terms of the hierarchy there is a manager who say the manager of each function and the managers then report to the ceo usually and that's why it's known as a more of a narrow uh, what do you say narrow hierarchy because it is just all the functions they are managers basically making up the board Like the marketing director, the sales director, the operations director, all of them are the, there. They are the ones making the decisions, and the functions are the ones which are following it, right? Functional structure clear, guys? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So again, in terms of performance management, look at advantages and disadvantages of functional structure again. so advantage is fairly you know again straightforward one of the main advantages is that there are lower costs since roles are roles are not duplicated if for example i had my structure otherwise where there is a specific marketing person for product a specific marketing person for product b then roles are being duplicated right same different people are doing the same thing for the company but if i have one common marketing team then i can have one expert who is in editing one expert who can handle say one of the social media of the one who can do print media etc etc people can be experts and roles don't have to be duplicated better control due to standardization again same logic if say yash is responsible for product a is marketing then i is responsible for product b is marketing both of them will apply their own ideas both of them will succeed with their marketing plans but it will be different when the, it's the same company doing something two different approaches will be going to the consumers but when they are in the same department it will be much more standardized probably both ideas will function in unison and that will be better for the company greater levels of employee motivation since specialists are grouped together naturally if one marketing person is supposed to be for this product the 
एक्सपर्ट कि एडिटिंग आल्सो यू डू दिस आल्सो यू डू एक्सेट्रा एक्सेट्रा इट माइट लाइक इट माइट बी अ प्रॉपर आइसोलेटिंग थिंग बट व्हेन इट्स अ टीम एंड एवरीवन इज ओनली डूइंग दे व्हाट दे आर बेस्ट एट देन नेचुरली देयर इज ग्रेटर एम्प्लॉई मोटिवेशन डिसएडवांटेजेस अनसूटेबल फॉर डाइवर्सिफाइड और ग्रोइंग ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस मतलब इट इज इज इट पॉसिबल दैट से सम uh say uh, company like say hindustan unilever having so many different brands etc etc just having one marketing department doing the whole thing for india they have different departments in different brands across the nation probably across the world because it's just too big and too diversified so a functional department can only work till one level after which you have to switch to the divisional structure which we look at next functional managers may make decisions that are good for themselves and not the organizations this problem is always everywhere if i am only responsible for marketing and not the product or not the department not the unit not the whatever i will do what is good for me i will not care about the end product whatever my targets are met i'm happy this is in making a slow due to long chain of command remember there is a difference between chain of command and hierarchy chain of command is needing like it since it's centralized directly things reach the board say i want to what do you say approve a marketing strategy i have to wait until things are being approved by the board etc and marketing has to be more uh, fast right if you otherwise you lose the market opportunity If something showing up, you're deciding. Okay, this strategy will help me, whatever, get some market share. And until you get approval, it's gone. The time has passed. So that's a problem. Right, guys? Clear so far? Yeah. Okay. Then we have divisional structure. Divisional structure, just like functional structure, but. here we are uh, split into separate divisions so separate divisions like we were discussing can be multiple products okay okay you are uh, for example uh, like say hindustan unilever only you are responsible for the biscuits someone is responsible for uh, say drinks or whatever they are different things that they are offering splitting things into divisions we keep on using the word strategic business units right <laughs> splitting things in strategic business units splitting things in subsidiaries say you can like um, you can uh, have different geographic locations where your company is present so one whole team will be responsible for the operations in india some team will be responsible for operations in middle east etc etc so that is called as a divisional structure under that again naturally you will have someone doing marketing someone doing sales someone doing operations but core structure is broken into divisions right so different under the main board or the main ceo it will be broken down into products or geographic area or whatever which was a disadvantage for functional structures becomes an advantage here that since you are the since you are operating in a divisional basis it's easy for you to grow and diversify you can always introduce a new product create a new team for it introduce a like enter a new market in some country and set up a team for it clear responsibility for the performance of each division like i said there the managers will not care like as long as my marketing is functional i don't care about the whole thing right your my whole role depends on the success of the product i have to ensure all success in the country i have to ensure that all things marketing finance operation sales all things are done well to ensure things go right that makes the top management free to focus on strategic matters like follow on on the last point only if it were a functional structure and we know the marketing manager only say focus on marketing the top level management has to focus on connecting everything but since here i am only looking into the divisions whatever they are doing so that leaves me as the board of director or as the strategic uh, level manager or whatever to 
then be able to look at the core strategy and not worry about how things are going with the current present situation this advantage is being obviously uh, inefficiencies inefficiencies due to duplication of functions like we said that's an advantage in functional structures your every product will have its own marketing every this will have its own uh, sales operations etc making it duplicate loss of goal congruence always always going to be a disadvantage still your managers will take decisions which are beneficial for say they are geographical unit but might be harmful for another unit in the same company something that we studied also being transfer pricing as a divisional structure i will like see my own benefit whatever have been good for my division if that means charging highly to my other division i don't care let them see what has to be done i will see about my division so it's another big big disadvantage clear so far guys yes yeah Oh. Finally, we have a network or a virtual structure. Quite simply, not having say a rigid functional form or a divisional form, but simply existing as a network of contracts. So the biggest example that we have in the world is Amazon. Amazon has their people, but the whole way the company is run, the company's structure. is that they don't have their own suppliers they don't have their own customers it is separate suppliers being ma matched with separate customers and they are simply acting as a network of contract the organization requires little to no physical premises i mean if everything was done by them then amazon would require big massive factories buildings everything right if they were producing everything that they sell if they were So like supplying everything that they sold, keeping inventory of everything, but that's the since they are not doing that, they don't need all that physical space. Employees and managers can work remotely, often connected using IT tools. Now, so this has become something for the whole world, regardless of your in like your company being a network structured or functional or divisional, but it's a primary thing in a network structure. obviously if you are relying on networks then you have to literally rely on it networks and stuff to for you to be able to do the business even suppliers and customers are directly connected to the same it system so that they also think that they are a part of it and the world like suppliers think they are a part of it and the world thinks that we are on a network but we are a real company like whenever we see amazon we don't think hey, this company is only a network we know that whatever it is it's all amazon like i just said the organization appears to the outside world just as any other traditional organization clear so far guys yeah yes so in the same way again now let's look at performance management for network structures the first being the organization has the flexibility to meet specific needs of a project obviously you are not say if uh, let's take the example of zell only right now if it's 20 students or 100 students i can take the lecture but if it were in class then there might be a limit of maybe 20 students right so with if i am a network if i'm existing as a network then i can be flexible to things i don't have to you know uh, be constrained by physical things or resources or whatever it can compete with large successful organizations they look and feel uh, like they being us the network structured business we are we look and feel bigger than what we actually are since we are a network we can you know play right outside our it can assemble the components needed to exploit market opportunities like again since you are operating as a network only if there's a big opportunity that's coming you can start like you can start picking up people in your uh, what do you say uh, uh bring people under your business and uh, 
just call it a your part of your business so i all aware of this company called anchor which is like trading in terms of wires and cables and yeah, all yeah. those sorts of things right yeah. i all aware that they introduced sanitizers and all these things in the pandemic yes yeah imagine a cable company doing it like a wire and a, what do you say electric equipment company doing it so the point is network companies make it happen sooner because they can immediately get people on board and take advantage of them being a network only they don't need to get say set up a new factory if they want to use another market opportunity lower cost due to low investment in assets again if i'm not sitting with big industries as my cost i obviously will have lower cost this advantages are big it may be difficult to reach agreement over common goals and measures like suppliers since they are not mine they they are free to back out if terms don't favor them all those things keep on happening and people will have like it is too difficult to have common goals with every single one because not every single one wants to work for you and help you succeed more they obviously want to do their own thing as well planning and control is very very difficult obviously if everyone is doing their own thing and you are not the boss of them you are just acting like a connector like we said a network of contracts then you can't ask them for data measures you can't ask them you can't uh, control them in terms of have them do certain things which are out of contract stuff like that loss of control may result in a number of problems such as confidentiality of information again since i don't have control 100% over one of my say suppliers then and to work with them i have to keep on sharing information with them say customers information for them to be able to supply things etc etc how can i be sure that they won't share my information it's a problem right so those sorts of things are again present when it's a network structure partners may work for competitors thus reducing competitive advantage all these rest- restaurants is is it so that only one restaurant is at one place say swiggy or zomato no right a lot of restaurants are working for both so it's like literally it's the same thing unless these guys obviously go for exclusives and stuff but the point being that that reduces your competitive advantage i don't need the brand i can order food from the same restaurant from either of you guys that makes me not worry about who is better or whatever that's the case right guys clear with the whole thing yes yeah right so to tackle this problem for um, network structures we have something that we need to understand which is known as service level agreements in short slas so slas are bas- basically simple legal agreements which are negotiated with whoever is your partner regarding the level of service to be provided matlab obviously the work that you will do but what about the information sharing how what about the systems that you and i use what about the data that i require how much will you be able to share etc etc all of that is discussed in advance a service level agreement is made basically a contract is drawn and then uh, obviously uh, things are taken forward because tell me guys it's a if say uh, i have an external supplier who supplies goods to a customer and the goods are of a poor quality now who is to blame is it me who is to blame or is it him who is to blame according to you all hello hello yeah you all understand understand my question um mm, can you repeat if i deliver yeah sure so if i deliver a poor quality product to you which was which was directly sent by one of my third party suppliers right so who will you hold to blame is it me or is it my supplier you you 
right because i am dealing with you you don't care about the supplier right so i have to ensure my contracts with my supplier are well drawn ki say if you return a defective product i can then take it and return it back ki okay, it's your product your thing was defective i can't take the blame for it even though the customer gives me blame i can pass on the blame these things have to be negotiated very well under a service level agreement ki what are you responsible for what am i responsible for so no matter what happens we understand who is to be put to blame clear with the idea yeah so one other thing that we need to consider which is not really a different business structure but is the service industry even when it comes to service industries with say with regards of information with regards of what to collect and all those sorts of things even things are different and things can be challenging so let's first just discuss those features of a, or a characteristics of a service industry which should be good revision for you guys very first thing a service is intangible obviously there is no physical take away that you have from a service when someone is providing a service you getting it at the same time right heterogeneity every service is different so if, even if you take this lecture for example if i'm supposed to teach the exact same thing again to someone else i might not be the same thing somewhere i might mess up somewhere i might do the same thing somewhere something might go better so obviously it can be the same thing every single service that is provided is different then we have perishability obviously services perish they are there's no like if there's no physical thing to take away only then nothing stays if uh, the time i'm giving the service and you all are receiving it there's nothing else later no transfer of ownership right fairly straight forward there's nothing you can own out of a service you can receive a service and that's oh and finally simultaneity again it's happening at the same time when you are receiving a service someone's providing a service not like someone's prepared a service and given it to you and then you're getting it it happens at the same time right guys yeah so when you talk about service quality and the problem with measuring service quality it is the only problem which we like basically discuss right now there is no physical product so we can't track it we can't do things with it we can't do the things with production we can't do things with end use etc etc so we can how how do you do it so you can look at more detailed things like soundness of advice given so again if if say the service is giving advice and stuff then you can get this from the customer that okay how was how sound was the advice attitude of the staff again service means staff members will be involved so you can look at the attitude of the staff again these things can basically be measured they are just examples ambience of the premises again service has to be given somewhere or somehow so what is what is the customer's take away on that speed of the service again quality is one thing but quality delivered at the right speed is also very important i can't take a year to teach you something that is supposed to be taught in a few months flexibility responsiveness obviously with uh, like you have to be flexible with certain things for the customers end experience to be good and consistent quality it can't be the same but it always every single time has to be a good quality service right guys decent examples these are just examples that you all can you know remember uh, if say in any service case you'll have to come up with certain kpis these are certain like again examples of kpis clear so far guys yeah yeah okay everyone okay oh. yes okay so let's move into the second phase that was to do with business structures that was one important area of the chapter and how we saw that in a quick question business integration is second it's less important but still models which we need to understand so business integration is quite simple all different aspects of a business whatever you are doing 
you can align them you can see where there are possibilities of integrating things getting things you know unnecessary things being eliminated all these sorts of things that you can do so that you achieve your objectives effectively for business integration we need to learn two models which again one is a revision of sort which is porter's value chain right so the whole diagram is obviously visible let's look into it in depth so porter's value chain is one of the most used models when it comes to things like supply chain management because it looks at what particular part in the value chain your business is doing and what it can do outside it to make it a whole value chain so first we need to understand the value chain so first we'll discuss the primary of activities so primary activities matlab anything in the primary sense of your business so starting with the inbound logistics which is whatever raw material say for example whatever things that are coming in which are not your end product but part of it become part of the inbound logistics then obviously we have operations operations can be obviously say you can work on the things make it a finished product etc then we have outbound logistics outbound logistics is basically finished product you can say supply distribution getting it to the end consumer all the things that happen in the extra, like the second half of the distribution then we have marketing and sales obviously distribute okay it reaches the shops but you need someone to sell it you need to market the product probably to for it to sell and finally there is service that you provide again this service here is referring to after sales service basically if you sold a product and it requires service then that is what we are talking about these are the primary activities in any uh, business is value chain what are the support activities the first being form infrastructure infrastructure as in it can be both the what do you say the physical thing and how the whole like uh, the things we discussed right now how is it all set up for the organization the better the bigger the fancier it better for the organization then we have human resources again people are required at the whole step of the primary activities and hr works into getting the right people for the right activities then we have technology technology obviously enhances every single thing things that can be automated things can be done easily monotonous things that can be eliminated technology allows to allows and gives support with that finally we have procurement procurement is again purchases but not the primary purchases you might require like you might have to purchase support things right to be able to get things done so you might have to purchase say assets like uh, factories your tempos all those sorts of things you might have to purchase it things and all those purchases comes under procurement right and obviously after all this and the difference between the selling thing becomes your margin got a good basic idea of porter's value chain guys Yes. Oh, so two things to know with Porter's value chain uh, in the exam perspective. One is obviously uh, not every company will have the whole value chain. Say, what if I'm a company which only looks at marketing and sales of someone else's product, right? So it it can be so that this is also the case. So then you have to look at it in a minute form, and you can look at. problems in those senses in those connections right and the more likely uh, type of it is where you just have to simply sort of explain the porter's value chain and uh, explain it in terms of a company which is the easiest thing you can do in terms of say uh, a company describes everything and you have to you know group it okay this 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 part is part of the inbound logistics this is part of the operations which is peanut marks if it does show up right so that was porter's value chain let's look at the advantages so it is particularly useful for focusing on how each activity in the process adds to the firm's overall competitive advantage 
when you start looking into it when you start breaking things in terms of the value chain you see what is the real value adding thing is it marketing and sales is it after sales services is it the core operation what is really adding value to the whole uh, firm emphasizes css within each activity and overall this is what like i was saying the first type of questions where they can just have one particular area and then you can have css based on that so like i said with any any model that you all see in apm it can be used for you to have css based on that so operations related css marketing related css fairly straightforward things examines both primary and support activities one of the more obvious advantages of the value chain that it looks at not only primary activities of a business but also the supporting activities which do play a important role it is more suited to a manufacturing environment uh, obviously in a service environment there might not be ways you can find out inbound logistics uh, operations outbound logistics not as easy it's not the same terminology right intended as a quantitative analysis tool but can be time consuming since it requires recalibrating the system to into these individual activities what this big point is simply saying is that it requires time to be able to break down the whole business and put things in the value chain which is where a question can show up like i said for you guys clear with the value chain guys yes yeah okay so the second model that we'll be looking into is called as mckinsey's 7s model right so this is how the model looks like but well, let's just discuss it properly in the next slide so the model is like i said there's seven s's they are broken down into two things one is the hard elements that are there in any company in the seven s's there are three hard elements and the other is soft elements which we we'll look at later so when we talk about this model right simply put it breaks down things into ss what comes under the strategy of the business what is the structure of the business how it is organized what comes under systems what systems are in place what systems need to be introduced etc etc these are harder elements what do they mean by hard it basically means that they are easier to define or identify like hard hard not in terms of difficult hard in terms of more of a physical sense like matlab they are noticeable right but soft elements soft matlab soft in terms of they are not tangible they are not they are more to do things with say culture right so you don't easily pick up and identify those things like say staff what kind of staff do we require it's not easily describable right you don't know who the best person for something will be management style what type of style should i be restricting should i be open should i do this should i do that you can't really easily understand that for a business shared values what kind of culture what kind of attitudes is most suitable for the whole organization and finally we have skills what skills do our staff or the whole company needs they do, do they need to be technologically proficient do they need some physical strength whatever we have so with the 7s model right it is not at all important it can only possibly show up for us at 3 4 marks where you have to discuss literally this slide just the logic of what is the hard element what is the soft element and what comes under that the whole idea is very like it's a good ideology of uh, if you look at the model it basically suggests that you can settle down a whole business in this web of seven things right that's the whole ideology but it's not a more effective approach clear on what you all need to know for this model guys yeah everyone yeah all right